Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you fasted 40 days and 40 nights for our justification. Give to us self-discipline that we may serve you more faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in uh, volume three of John Strip's Memorials of the Reverend Father and God, Thomas Cranmer. And the date here looks like 1553. It is the Archbishop advises professors to fly. Get out of England because Mary's coming. The favors of religion, seeing it was now determined to proceed in all manner of severity against them, began to flee into other countries for their safety as fast as they could. Indeed, there were some that made a case of conscience of it. Among the rest, one Mrs. Wilkinson, a woman of good quality and a great reliever of good men. Her, the archbishop, out of prison, advised to escape and avoid a place where she could not truly and rightly serve God. He took off with spiritual arguments, the objections which she or others might make for their stay. As their loathness to leave their friends and relations, and that it might look like slandering of God's word if they should thus run away and decline the open and bold defense of it. The letter of the Archbishop deserves to be read as it fell from that venerable prelate's own pen, which I have therefore put in the appendix. Though Cranmer himself refused to flee, being advised by his friends so to do, because of the reports that were abroad that he should be speedily carried to the tower, for he said, it would be no ways fitting for him to go away, considering the post in which he was, and to show that he was not afraid to own all the changes that were by his means made in the last reign. But great numbers fled, some to Strasbourg, some to Vessel, some to Emden, some to Antwerp, some to Duisburg, some to Worms, some to Frankfurt, some to Basel, Zurich and Aero in Switzerland, and some to Geneva, to the number of 800 and upwards. And these are the names of some of the refugees. Bishops, Poinet of Winchester, Barlow of Bath and Wells, Scory of Chichester, Coverdale of Exxon, and Bale of Austria. Deans, Richard Cox, Dean of Christ Church, Oxford, and of Westminster, James Haddon, Dean of Exeter, Robert Horn of Durham, William Turner of Wells, Thomas Sampson of Chichester, Archdeacons, Edmund Cranmer, the Archbishop's brother, Archdeacon of Canterbury, John Aylmer of Stowe, Bullingham of Lincoln, Thomas Young, Precentor of St. David's, Doctors of Divinity and Preachers, Edmund Grindle, Robert King, Edwin Sands, John Jewell, Reynolds, Pilkington's two brothers, John Joseph, David Whitehead, John Elvey, John Peddler, John Biddle, Thomas Beacon, Robert and Richard Turner, Edmund Alling, three brothers, John Peakins, Thomas Cottesford, Thomas Donnell, Alexander Noel, now that's a new name here, with his brother, Bartholomew Treheron, John Woolock, John Old, John Medwell, John Ruff, John Knox, John Appleby, John Perkhurst, Edward Large, Gaff Jones, Robert Crowley, Robert Wisdom, Robert Watson, William Goodman, Anthony Gilby, William Whittingham, that's an interesting name too, John Macabray, uh, Henry Reynolds, James Purse, Jug, Edmonds, Cole, 
Mountain, two fishers, David Sampson, John Bendel, Ballman, Humphrey, Bentham, Remiger, Bradage, Saul. Besides of noblemen, merchants, tradesmen, artifer, artificers, and plebeians, many hundreds. And God provided graciously for them and raised them up friends in England that made large contributions from time to time for their relief and for the maintenance as such as were scholars. And students of divinity especially. And great was the favor that the stranger showed to the fugitive guests. Here at home, vengeance was taken upon those that set up the Lady Drain, Jane. The chief of all, the Duke of Northumberland, was brought to Tower Hat Hill to lose his head, who indeed was cared for by nobody, and was the only instrument of putting the king upon altering the succession, and who broadly talked of to have been the shortener of that excellent prince's life by poison to make room the sooner for his son's advancement who had married the said Jane. In prison he was visited by Bishop Heath and afterwards pretended to be brought off by him to the acknowledgement of the Roman Catholic religion. After his condemnation he with the Marquis of Northampton, Sir Andrew Dudley's Sir John Gates, Thomas Palmer heard a mass within the tower and received the sacrament in one kind after the popish fashion. The Duke of Northumberland was drawn hereunto by a promise that was made to him that if he would recant and hear mass, he should have his pardon, yea, though his head were on a block. <coughs> His speech, August 22, when he was executed, <coughs> he acknowledged how he had been misled by others. Called preachers seditious and lewd and advised the people to return home to their old religion. And that since the new religion came among them, God had plagued them by wars and tumults famine and pestilence. He propounded the example of the Germans, how their doctrine had brought ruin upon them, and quoted that article in the creed to them, I believe the Catholic Church, to convince them of the Roman Catholic faith. If this speech were not of Heath's indicting to be used by the Duke, yet this argument from the creed I am apt to think was his, it being his custom to make use of it, <laughs> where I find in a conference betwixt this bishop and Rogers, he asked him if he did not know his creed and urged Credo Sanctum Ecclesium Catholicum. But Rogers could tell him that he did not find the bishop of Rome there. If any be minded to see the Duke's speech at length, he may have recourse to the appendix where I have set it down as I have found in one of the Cottonian volumes. But Gates and Palmer, notwithstanding their hearing a mass at their execution the same day and place, confessed the faith they had learned in the gospel. The former confessed that he had lived as viciously and wickedly all his life as any in the world and yet that he was a great reader of scripture, but a worse follower there was not living. For he read it not to edify, but to dispute and to make interpretations after his own fancy, exhorting the people to take heed how they read God's word and played and gamed with the holy mysteries. For he told them that except they humbly submitted themselves to God and read his word charitably, and to the intent edified thereby, it would be but poison to them and worse. So asked the queen and all of the world forgiveness. Palmer thanked God for his affliction. And for that, he'd learned more in one dark little corner 
of the tower than ever learned by any travels in as many places as he had been that he had seen God and he was in his numerous works and his mercies. And so concluding that he feared not death, he is seeing himself thoroughly what he was, a lump of sin and earth and all vileness, the vilest. And so concluding that he feared not death, that neither the sprinkling of blood or two shed before his eyes <clears throat> nor the shedding thereof, nor the bloody axe itself should make him afraid. And so praying all to pray for him, he said some prayers without any daunting, laid down his head on the block. <clears throat> but the Duke of Northumberland submitted himself to base and mean practices to save his life. He renounced his religion he disavowed that he ever was of the religion professed in Edward's days, if we may believe Parsons, but only hypocritically for worldly ends complied with it. And if he might have lived, he could have been contented to spend his days in a mouse hole. Well, from a priest I have this relation, and the papists best knew the intrigues of Queen Mary's reign. After per sentence pronounced upon him, he made means to speak with Bishop Gardner, who he knew could do most of any with the queen. When the bishop came to him in company with another counselor to be witness of their discourse, who himself told my author these passages, the duke asked the bishop if there were no hope at all for him to live and to do some penance the rest of his life days for his sins past. Alas, saith he, let me live a little longer, though it be but in a mouse hole. The bishop replied that he wished to God anything could have contented his grace, but a kingdom when he was at liberty and in prosperity. And even at that present, he wished it lay in his power to give him that mouse hole. For he would allow him the best palace he had in the world for that mouse hole and did moreover then offer to do for him what he could possibly. But because his offense, he said, was great and sentence passed against him and his adversaries many, it would be best for him to provide for the worst. And especially that he stood well with God in matter of conscience and religion for to speak plainly as he went on, it was most likely he must die. The Duke answered he would dispose himself and desired he might have a learned priest sent him for his confession and spiritual comfort. And as for religion, said he, you know, my Lord Bishop, that I can be of no other but of yours, which is the Catholic. For I never was of any other indeed, nor ever so foolish as to believe any of that which we have set up in Edward's day, but only to use the same to my own purpose of ambition, for which God forgive me. And so I mean to testify publicly at my death, for it is the truth. The bishop, saith my author, went away with an afflicted heart and shed many tears as he returned and went to the queen and entreated so earnestly for him as he had half gained her consent for his life, which so much terrified the Duke's adversaries as presently they got the Emperor Charles that was in Flanders to write to the queen a very resolute and earnest letter that it was not safe for her nor the state to pardon his life. And with that, he was executed. Whatever credit is to be given to the rest of the relation, I can hardly believe that passage that he is reported to say to the bishop that he was never otherwise than a Roman Catholic and that he did all along dissemble his religion for worldly ends and that he would testify as much at his death. Because this doth no ways comport with his speech upon the scaffold wherein he mentioneth no such thing, but rather the contrary. 
nor did he declare any such thing when he came to die. He said indeed that he was deceived and misled, but nowhere that he dissembled. And if you were deceived, he dissembled not. And here ends that particular chapter. And let's call it an end. Glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.